This week on It's Still Real to Them, I want to share a story from Gary Michael Capetta's book, Body Slams, Memoirs of a Pitchman. It's the story of an obsessed fan, and for once, said fan is female. So join me as we take a trip back to the mid-1970s when the IWC was on paper, and it was called a fan club. Gary Michael Capetta is an American professional wrestling ring announcer, author, voiceover artist, screenwriter, stage performer, and teacher. For years, he was dubbed the world's most dangerous announcer by his longtime friend and colleague, Jim Cornette. Capetta was the ring announcer on World Wrestling Federation broadcasts from 1974 to 1985. He followed that up with stints in the American Wrestling Association, the National Wrestling Alliance, and World Championship Wrestling. He was released from World Championship Wrestling in May 1995 due to budget cuts. In October of 2000, he wrote and self-published Body Slams, Memoirs of a Wrestling Pitchman. Capetta has also done work for Ring of Honor, doing backstage interviews for their DVD releases. He was also the ring announcer for the 2004 wrestling game Showdown, Legends of Wrestling. More recently, on the February 26, 2020 episode of AEW Dynamite, Capetta presided over the AEW Revolution main event weigh-in as the master of ceremonies between AEW world champion Chris Jericho and John Moxley. Following my inauspicious debut on Championship Wrestling, fans along the wrestling circuit perceived me in a strikingly different light. While I had once been seen as a hapless but determined kid trying to be part of the show, TV had turned me into a celebrity who added an importance to the live events where I announced. It was just as Monsoon had anticipated when he put me on TV. People began to ask for my autograph, some even brought me gifts. Those who wouldn't give me the time of day before now wanted to buy me a Rolex. They judged me based on just 20 seconds of airtime every week. I could have been the most despicable ingrate on earth. It didn't matter. I was rubbing elbows with their TV wrestling heroes, for which they thought I earned great sums of money. If they only knew that my price tag was just $21.67 per show. With time, my identification with the WWWF spread to the general public, whether I was shopping, out to a movie, or walking down Theater Row in New York City. People regularly stopped to ask about the show and about the wrestlers. The routine remained the same. After hesitating momentarily, they first approached to confirm that I was indeed Gary Michael Capetta. Once convinced, my curious inquisitors invariably asked, what are you doing here? I always took that question to mean that they knew where I was supposed to be and wherever we were wasn't it. As if I spent the week in their TV sets, and with a touch of the remote control, I'd spring into action every Saturday night. During my first year on the WWWF broadcast, I enjoyed the attention, but after the unhealthy attraction of a fan one year later, I would forever tread carefully when approached by strangers. I learned early in my career that this wonderful opportunity could become very dangerous. After an event in West Orange, New Jersey, I had been signing autographs for a few of the youngsters at ringside when I noticed a young woman waiting on the fringe of the crowd. As I made my way back to the dressing room, Esther, as I came to call her, sidestepped in front of me and eyeballed me face to face. After a few uncomfortable moments, I stepped to the right and she followed. A couple of steps to the left and we were still nose to nose. Since ballroom dancing was not my forte, I thought it best to find out what she wanted so I could waltz back to the dressing room as quickly as possible. Did you enjoy the show? My attempt at small talk was met with giggles. No words, just giggles. So I continued. Well, there is always a good crowd. The show's usually better when the fans are enjoying themselves. The monologue continued pointlessly until finally I blurted out, Can I do anything for you? She appeared stunned at my expectation that a successful dialogue takes teamwork. I think so, she tittered timidly. I think I'd like to start a fan club. That's great. What kind of fan club? A fan club for you. She gazed at me longingly, like a kid asking for two bucks in advance of her allowance. I was stunned. 
What do you mean? Was the only thing I could say to what I thought I had heard. I'm going to start the Gary Michael Capetta fan club. Suddenly, she switched from what she'd like to do to what she was going to do. The first thought that came into my mind came out of my mouth. Who would join a fan club for me? I've been talking to people at ringside and a lot of them are interested. It was 1977, a time when fan clubs for wrestlers were commonplace, but an organization to honor a ring announcer was unprecedented. Our role was an expected formality, which, until the animal and I collided, added little to a wrestling event other than to introduce the performers. So I shied away from the improbable idea until months later when Esther resurfaced at many of the New York area WWWF events. She renewed her unrelenting request for my permission to form the club, but now she was a little more forceful. Each time she embellished her sales pitch with different ways a fan club could be beneficial, always emphasizing that there was no downside to her idea. Eventually her words began to stick with me until I seriously considered the possibilities. There's nothing to lose, I thought. If it turns out to be a bad idea, it'll just die a natural death. At the time, I had no idea how prophetic those words would be. Despite my anxiety that being the honoree of a fan club could make me the laughingstock of the wrestling world, my ego gave way to better judgment and I agreed to endorse the project. My naivete prevented the healthy skepticism of someone more worldly than myself. As soon as I gave her my blessing, Esther quickly began to enlist young and old alike from every corner of McMahon's territory. For a nominal fee, each member received a monthly state-of-the-art fan club bulletin. In no time, Gary Michael Capetta t-shirts, photo buttons, and mugs became available. News of the club hit pro wrestling periodicals, bringing an immediate and positive reaction. Our good friend Esther, president of the Gary Capetta fan club, tells us that membership is increasing by leaps and bounds. And it's no wonder, it's a great bulletin, professionally printed and chock full of current stories and news for a great honorary ring announcer, Gary Capetta. This club is first class all the way and has Rasslin Wonders' strongest endorsement. And there was more. He is not a wrestler, manager, or even a referee. However, he happens to be one of the most popular wrestling personalities in the Worldwide Wrestling Federation. He is Gary Michael Capetta, the official ring announcer of the WWWF television tapes. Gary happens to be an ex-writer for ring wrestling. The bulletin for the club is called The Magical Microphone. Professionally printed, this publication is filled with stories not only on Gary, but various wrestling personalities. Photos fill the pages of the bulletin, which sells for 75 cents an issue or $3.50 a year. Members receive photos, membership cards, and periodic bulletins. Esther is the president of the fan club and is a really sincere fan. Tom Burke, Ring Wrestling, April 1978. Wow, he was talking about me. Just a few years ago, I had written for that magazine. Now they were writing about me. On December 10th, 1977, due largely to Esther's lobbying efforts, I was named Announcer of the Year at the New York City Wrestling Fans Convention. Then, the Wrestling Fans International Convention named the Gary Capetta Fan Club Rookie Fan Club of the Year, and the Magical Microphone was named Bulletin of the Year for as long as Esther presided. Reporters began calling for interviews. Hosts of radio sports shows invited me to field questions from callers. Two-page profiles were printed in national wrestling magazines. The attention I received was unprecedented for a ring announcer. One headline read, The Magic Microphone, Gary Capetta, Inside the Voice of Wrestling. This excerpt from the introduction to that article illustrates the attention Esther's one-woman publicity campaign had initiated. There are many ring announcers in the United States, literally hundreds upon hundreds. But other than a select few, like Jimmy Lennon in Los Angeles, very few are known, remembered, and sought after by fans and promoters alike. The most recent entry into this special elite circle is the youthful Gary Capetta, who beams into the living rooms weekly as announcer for Championship Wrestling. And when you talk to Gary Capetta, there's just no wonder as to why he has captured the imagination of so many rooters of the squared circle. Gary Capetta is now recognized by millions of viewers as his weekly announcing is seen across the Northeast, from Bangor, Maine, to Washington, D.C., and from New York 
to Baltimore. His live appearances have taken him from New York to Pittsburgh, and he has appeared in over 200 arenas, always complete with carnation and bow tie. And no doubt those fans who do have the opportunity to meet Gary Capetta will find him to be as happy, knowledgeable, and congenial as we found this great young ring announcer to be. Mike Omansky Wrestling Review, June 1980. It was an exciting time. It seemed as if my notoriety had skyrocketed overnight. The Pope, in his infinite wisdom, never hired a public relations team that could hold a candle to Esther's single-minded crusade. She labored non-stop, as would a religious fanatic in the name of St. Gary Michael. The steaming presses never stopped rolling. Center this headline and justify the margins. Enlarge this picture by 25%. Shrink that one by 52%. Her unending use of copy machines may have been the reason that 24-hour copy centers were invented. All signs indicated that her campaign to familiarize the wrestling public with my work was successful. But little by little, I began to hear stories that just didn't add up. Esther booked personal appearances I knew nothing about. I was told of times when she claimed I was with her when I wasn't. Before I knew it, more stories, horror stories, surfaced among the club members. Eventually, there were allegations that Esther began soliciting money from fans beyond regular membership dues. Before I could make sense of it all, troubling reports emerged that female club members were receiving threatening letters and obscene phone assaults from a mysteriously disguised caller. When I questioned Esther about these rumors, she brushed them off as gossip and skillfully swayed the conversation elsewhere. She worried only about the damaging effects such rumors could have on enlisting more fans. When I told her I was more concerned for the well-being of our terrified club members, Esther quickly changed the subject, bemoaning the countless illnesses from which she suffered. She had begun wrapping her legs with gauze and bandages to treat what she referred to as a rare skin condition. Addressing the threats that upset club members proved futile. Finally, what should have been obvious much sooner became crystal clear when people began to congratulate me on my recent engagement to Esther. I was shocked and then outraged to learn that I was shocked and then outraged to learn that it was my fan club president who was jubilantly spreading these absurd lies. Quickly moving to distance myself from the monster I had empowered, I informed her that our collaboration had to end immediately. Expecting hysteria from my unpredictable fiance, I was instead struck by her dreamy gaze upon hearing the news. Esther was lost in an eerily hollow stupor. But if I thought I had put this dangerous chapter behind me, once again, I was naively mistaken. For several months following Esther's ouster, she continued to show up at all of my public appearances. While everyone's attention was on the mid-ring action, her piercing eyes never left me. With a fixed, angry glare, her eyes all but singed the velvet from my oversized bow tie. She began to dress in black and wore dark-tinted eyeglasses. Somehow, she was always able to secure front row tickets strategically positioned across the ring from the announcer's table. So we sat face to face, night after night. If her bizarre behavior was intended to scare the hell out of me, she was doing just fine. The last time Esther was seen at a wrestling event was in Asbury Park, 20 miles from my home. She was bound in somber black from head to toe like a bitter widow attending the funeral of her backstabbing bridegroom. She floated through the crowd, self-absorbed in the forbidding fog of a far-off planet. As was customary, I went out for a quick snack with a few friends after the Asbury show and then headed directly home. Turning onto the street where I lived, I noticed a shimmering ball of light on my front lawn. As my car rolled up to the curb, a crackling bonfire spit charred embers in all directions. My heart began to pound with the force of a vicious Chief J Strongbow tomahawk chop. I flew out of the car and trounced the simmering embers like the chief on a warpath. As the flames slowly died down, I could see scorched remnants of club newsletters, press clips, and publicity photos. Something that started so innocently had spun so far out of control. The last time I heard from Esther was perhaps the most bizarre. She sent a letter to me with a warning about the evil that lived within the soul of Gary Michael Capetta. She never addressed her comments to me directly, but instead talked about me, as if she were alerting a third party about the treacherous Gary Capetta. Esther Navalik of the Philippine Islands. 
Esther never surfaced on the wrestling scene again. Like a misguided meteor, she vanished into a ball of fire. Sadly, Esther's mental and physical ailments ultimately led to her early death. It wasn't until much later that I discovered the extent of her illnesses. The bandages that covered her legs concealed self-inflicted pencil point wounds resulting in recurring cases of lead poisoning. When her body was discovered, well after her tenure as president had ended, authorities found a shrine to the fan club in the corner of her bedroom. It was adorned with club memorabilia surrounding photos that documented my announcing career. Her bedroom walls were covered with writing samples, including my signature, that she used to perfect her skills of forgery to disguise bogus letters and sign unauthorized checks. It was now clear to me that the purpose of Esther's work was to win my attention and approval. When her efforts failed to be rewarded with my affection, she became intent on distancing me from all others. If she couldn't claim me for her own, then nobody would. Anyone who stood in the way of Esther's fantasy relationship with me was at risk. It was all very sad. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of It's Still Real to Them. I'm currently working on the next big episode of the show, but I still wanted to put something out there for you guys this week. I chose this story because it was the first time in which the female was the obsessed fan. It's a pretty rare case in the world of wrestling. It's happened a few other times, but it's not the norm. So I thought I'd share this especially obsessive fan story. If you enjoyed the video and the things that I do on the channel, consider signing up to the Patreon. The link is in the description. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you in the next one.